Welcome to the Alien Probe Podcast. Today we're going to be exploring convincing parapsychology stories. The existence of paranormal research suggests that even the more, most hardened of skeptics want to believe that there are more things on heaven and earth that are dreamt of in their philosophies, to paraphrase Shakespeare. However, accredited scientific research into the paranormal remains controversial. Even comprehensive and evidence-heavy studies are often still considered pseudoscience by doubters, and it's difficult to know where the burden of proof actually lies. Still, scientists, at least open-minded ones of the Einsteinian variety, continue to be fascinated by the unknown. Some specialists focus on children who claim to dream about and even actively remember their past lives. Others test the supposed abilities of mediums and other potentially gifted individuals. The more mainstream scientific community may scoff at these avenues of research, but certain academics and scientists continue to press onwards in their studies of parapsychology. Ready to be, to, to be convinced, Deb? I'm ready, Doug. How's it going? You had, we had the week off. Had Kevin last week, so uh, you all ready? All fired up? I'm all ready to be back involved. All right. And happy birthday, by Thank the way. You, Doug. Twenty. 20? We don't like Oh, you're not going to? Okay. I thought I'm, 20 something. I'm, I'm legal to drink. Let's let awesome. that Awesome. We will yes. do that later. All right. Well, let's delve right into it. All right. What you got? I've got a Dr. Tucker. He, he's, he does this kind of studies he mentioned in the next. He's on the first two too. segments. Yeah. Yes. He um, studied a reincarnated fighter pilot a in a two-year-old. Um, Dr. Jim Tucker is a child psychologist and associate professor of psychiatry and neurobehavioral sciences at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. He has worked with many children who have inexplicably recounted memories that are not their own, that are often linked to real life individuals who live decades in the past and thousands of miles away. One of his most convincing cases concerned a boy named James Leininger, who at age two, began having horrible nightmares of violent plane crashes. According to this article, Leininger, Leininger was able to recount vivid details about World War II military operations. He also inexplicably knew a great deal about fighter jets. At two. At two. And most kids can barely do the... <laughs> you ever talk to a two-year-old? You ever talk to... And this was me. And this was... An, that's my aircraft carrier. Because Is most, that the Lexington? Most two-year-olds, only yeah. their mother can understand them and has to translate for... <laughs> so okay. I... That's a... This I'm hundred, skeptical. This, this two-year-old <laughs> could really name these things. This is impressive. Okay. Well, um, most well, significantly... Leininger was but he, able, was, he was already alive before, so he's, really, uh, he's obviously he's, very advanced. He's very intelligent. Yeah. Um, he was able to recall the name of a real aircraft carrier, which I can't do, mm. and a real soldier named James Houston, who had actually died near Iwo Jima. Every detail this kid put forth has been verified. There's no way of proving the story in the linear sense, but as Tucker pointed out to NPR in a 2014 interview, it seems absolutely impossible that Leininger could have somehow gained this information as a two-year-old through some yeah. sort of normal media. <laughs> yeah, he hopped read a book. on the internet. Hey, you He's know gonna, what? And then make it up. That was me. going to read a you book. Know? Yeah. I don't think that's in his little bookshelf. Well, at least, my, okay, this one, at least mine's four. Okay, a four-year-old told <laughs> UVA he was a reincarnated film agent. Well, that's much more interesting than a, <laughs> a few years ago. Pilot. Also, again, Dr. Jim Tucker of the University of Virginia made headlines when he began investigating a young boy. They must report all these to Jim. You know, I got another one for you, Jim. This one's four. <laughs> Named see, Ryan I see Hammond. Jim's office. According to reports, a um, boy named Raymond Hammond, according to reports, Hammond had had vivid nightmares from a very early age. He's already at an early age. No, it, it was <laughs> ones, four, four. Ones that almost invariably concluded with, it. you know, we can do UFO stories and not make, this is more believable than a lot of the UFO it stories. Are we all serious on the UFO? And it came from the sky. You're making fun of children. I know. It's, yeah, it's That's evil. Um. Ones that almost invariably concluded with him waking up in the middle of the night, screaming and clutching his chest, saying he dreamed his heart exploded when he was in Hollywood. Of one night, while the boy was still in preschool, he told his mother that he suspected he's once been someone else. I'd like to have been there for that. 
conversation. Uh-huh. So I was, I'm not really me. Yeah, you might find yourself in, you know, the nut house. Uh-huh. Hammond's mother visited the local library and took out some books on old Hollywood, hoping that their photographs would somehow help to pacify her son. To her surprise, the child immediately gravitated toward a still from a 1930s film called Night After Night. He identified himself as one Marty Martin. <laughs> Marty Martin. I'm an agent. Super agent. Who turned out to be a Hollywood agent who had died of a heart attack. It's not funny. <laughs> it's, it really isn't funny. The dog, the dog farting. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> that part isn't funny either. I'm about to die. <laughs> Happy birthday to me. Hi, hi, Annabelle. Thanks for coming in to visit. <laughs> Hammond also accurately described Martin's family and the home he had lived in back in the 40s. Yeah, I'm stuck in a small room with a farting dog. Thank you. In 2001, a study finds consistency Doesn't get any more real than this. in near-death experiences. <laughs> yeah, near-death. My <laughs> eyes are watering. In 2001, the UK-based medical journal, The Lancet, published a study on near-death experiences, or NDEs, in hospitals. The 13-year trial was conducted by Dr. Pim Van Lommel, a prominent researcher in the field of near-death studies. Van Lommel's trials, which were conducted in 10 different Dutch medical facilities, involved 344 patients who had actually died for a significant number of minutes. Eventual findings revealed that 18% of the patients had some memory from their period of unconsciousness, and 12% had what the physicians called a core or deep near-death experience. Their near-death experiences included, why do they say NDE experiences? They're near-death, that's it. That's NDE. That, They're that NDE, e near-death experience experiences. Yeah, that's superfluous. We don't need that. Ooh. Included, I know, out-of-body perception, moving through a tunnel, communication with light, blissful feelings, observation of a celestial landscape, meeting with deceased persons, life review, and, pro- oh, I do not want oh, to see your life it. code for it. Oh, well, that, I, mean, I feel like I'm getting a performance your... review <laughs> <laughs> and presence of a border. Moreover, when said patients were interviewed years later, their stories were still completely consistent. Well, they, they say you're, they say you're, your life, life flashes. I know, but when they say a life review, I think of a, a re- evaluation. performance review. An evaluation. Look at all the things you did wrong. The CIA Stargate, uh, Stargate project experimented with remote viewing. In 1978, the CIA launched the Stargate project, a top secret experiment in remote viewing, which has been defined as the ability to see or sense events from a distance. Designated Designed to explore potential in espionage, the study yielded many remarkable findings before it was suspended in the late 1980s. Um, it so happens that we just did there. You missed the remote viewing from last week, and I did with Kevin, did. the APP episode, Remote Viewing. I'll listen. The History of Stargate Projects and that project and other ESP-type government projects are there. That was quite interesting. In 1995, the CIA finally declassified the project's files. According to its sources, one of the project's co-founders, Russell Tark, reportedly carried out a 10,000-mile remote viewing experiment between Moscow and San Francisco with Juna Davidishvi, a prominent <laughs> Russian healer. Davidishvi successfully described the whereabouts of an individual, even though he was thousands of miles away. In another experiment, a retired police officer apparently described a secret Soviet weapons lab after being given its geographical coordinates. Skeptics may scoff, but the powers that be did not. The study's results were apparently convincing enough to warrant a former congressional investigation to determine if there had been a breach of national security. Well, Cornell University tested how humans can anticipate the future. You might not associate Cornell University with psychic research, Excuse me, but Daryl Bim, Professor Emeritus of Psychology, has an impressive track record of his own. In 2010, the results of one of Bim's most notable studies were finally published. As the Cornell Chronicle put it, the eight-year study, which spanned nine experiments and included more than a thousand participants, ended up offering evidence that humans have some ability to anticipate the future. 
BEM's experiments were apparently based on people's ability to respond to events, quote, before stimulus, stimulus were presented. Before stimulus was presented. Yeah. How do you do that? <laughs> In the end, all but one of the nine experiments confirmed the hypothesis that PSI, or psychic phenomenon, exists. The study was subsequently published by the American Psychological Association's Journal, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. Social Psychology. The university, and on a lighter note, the University of Arizona tested mediums. So mediums, these are the people that they, they talk to the dead, dead people. I talk to dead people. This would be so fascinating. Is it Bruce Willis, right? Gary E. Schwartz, professor of psychiatry and neurology at the University of Arizona, and Julie Beichel, a member of the Society of Scientific Exploration and the Society for Psychical Research, are highly respected figures in the parapsychology world. One of the most notable studies took place in conjunction with the University of Arizona's Labor Laboratory of Advances of Consciousness and Health, LACH. The project was designed to test the accuracy of mediums in receiving information about deceased people. In this experiment, the me, where am I at? Yeah. Okay. In this experiment, eight University of Arizona students, four of whom had experienced the death of a parent and four of whom had experienced the death of a peer, were paired with eight mediums. The mediums in question didn't know the students or their deceased acquaintances, and all pairings were conducted remotely. Nevertheless, the study's findings ultimately and convincingly suggested that certain mediums could anomalously receive accurate information about deceased individuals. That's fascinating. That is. Um, the University of Southampton finds proof of life after death. There needs to be more to this one. Um, in 2014, scientists at the University of Southampton unveiled the results of a trial that has been called the largest ever medical study into near-death and out-of-body experiences ever. It involved approximately 2,060 people living in the United Kingdom, the United States, and Austria, 40% of whom described some kind of awareness before they were revived. So I need more than just one paragraph on that. We need. Can you look into it? We will look into it. Can you bring that. me an hour? I don't know if I can bring you an hour, but I, need an I hour. think we need to. We can do one or two. If that's the largest ever, there must be some results out there that we need to look into. Fascinating. Yes. The Ryan Research Center used cards to test people for ESP. I'm sure everyone's heard about this, but the Ryan Research Center is one of the oldest accredited paranormal research societies in the United States. Originally founded by Joseph Banks Ryan and his colleague, psychologist William McDougall. The organization began as a parapsychology research lab at Duke University. Eventually, it broke off from the college, after they probably threw them out, and became its own institution. With its emphasis on everything from post-mortem survival, I can just see Duke. Yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah, it post do this post-mortem emphasis 101. Um, post-mortem survival for psychic phenomena, such as telepathy, and clairvoyance, the organization has attracted attention from eminent scholars from all over the world. In the 1920s, researchers began to study ESP, extrasensory perception. The center's most famous tests involve specifically designed cards, which we've held up out of sight of the test subject. The participants would then guess the design of the card, and many guessed in ways that were far too uncanny to be the product of mere luck. The Rhine continues to be criticized by skeptics, but it also has decades of legitimate research to its name. Well, you know that's out you, there. Yeah, and you know that's the thing where they hold up a card, and it's not like an ace of spades. It's like a has a star right. or well, but you, something I mean, on it. They, oh, yeah, that's a star. And, you hear about people who are, you know, especially people who are close to each other or twins that, you know, they feel things that, you know, like one gets hurt and the other one, like, jumps up. You know, you know that people have a connection other than what we know about. No, oh, absolutely. Uh, Princeton University tried to psychically transmit information. Yes, so Princeton's not. Duke's scared of doing it, but Princeton. But this one, this one is weird to me. Okay, so much like the great beyond itself, Princeton's PEAR, P-E-A-R, laboratory, 
As the New York Times described, it was, quote, an anomaly from the start, a ghost in the machine of physical science that was never acknowledged as substantial and yet never entirely banished. The lab was a controversial part of the university for almost 30 years, but when it closed its doors for good in 2007, it had more than a few notable experiments to its credit. Many of these studies involved attempts to psychically transmit information. According to researchers, in most of the tests, the receiver received the information from the sender precognitively, up to several days before it was sent. More specifically, most of the experiments, quote, demonstrated precognitive intervals of up to approximately 150 hours, which is nearly a week. That's weird. So they get it before it was sent. I mean, it's weird enough that I could send you a message. To buy flowers? Telepathically, but that you would get it a week before I sent it? That one's, yeah. just, that one's odd to me. Yeah, usually I get your messages two days before. Two days? Oh, it's only yeah, two days, like not two a week. Days, oh, yeah, only two days. Investigations aided by psychics and their aftermaths. People have claimed to possess clairvoyant powers allowing them to predict the future and solve mysteries for thousands of years. Today, many are scornf scornful, scornful of the idea that psychics scornful mm -hmm. of the idea that psychics help the police with criminal cases. Yet law enforcement personnel trained to be skeptical and discerning admit to using psychics as investigative tools. While serious publications may resist the idea that there are psychics who aided the police, there is one medium that allows police, psychics, and victims' family members to tell their stories to the public. Reality television, course, baby. Good old reality Hell yeah. TV. We love it. Shows like Psychic Investigators and Psychic Detectives present viewers with first-hand accounts of citizens who use their paranormal abilities to uncover clues mm -hmm. in criminal cases. In going public with these stories, law enforcement personnel are willing to put their professional integrity on the line. The stigma surrounding psychic ability is apparent in the dated cliches some reporters use to describe psychics, painting them as carny types and staring into crystal balls. The New York Times manages to sniff at the idea of, sniff at the idea of cops working with psychics while simultaneously casting citing a survey that acknowledges 35% of the 50 largest U.S. police stations admitting to doing just uh, that. That percentage could be even higher, as Captain Bob Ingalls noted in the Blood Money episode of Psychic Detectives. Using psychics is employed by many police agencies. Some agencies don't talk about it, and some do. It's clear that many psychic claims are bogus and may even hindered investigations. But the testimony of detectives and police officers who've worked successfully with psychics is difficult to summarily dismiss. In the following police investigations that use psychics, the police, the psychic was credited by law enforcement as providing helpful information. I don't know why, if, if you use it, it works, did fine. If you use it, it doesn't, don't say anything. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, I bet, you know, the problem is, you know, who wants to take credit for finding things? The police officer. Yeah, well, that's true. And you know, so in this one, a detective credits a psychic as the reason he found the body of a missing woman. On June 1st of 1996, 22-year-old single mother, Nicole Arrakis, left her daughter with her parents to go out for the evening. As told in an episode of Psychic Investigators, when Nicole didn't return that night, her father reported her missing to Detective Jim Novak of the Sayreville, New York, New Jersey Police Department. With a helicopter parent there. One night? One night. Well, you know. Well, she, it's a daughter, yeah. Gotta, if I had a daughter, I had three boys, I never really, but, hey, don't come But now he's, a, you know, he's left with his kid. I think maybe, you know, mm. she needs to come get her kid. Okay, Detectives interviewed Nicole's boyfriend, Michael Reed, who reportedly claimed that he last saw, saw Nicole before she went out drinking the night she disappeared. According to Detective Novak, he knew Nicole was dead when Reed referred to her in the past tense, telling Novak, I didn't love Nicole. We were only friends. But the detective but had boyfriend, no evidence to back up his suspicion. The boyfriend was a friend with benefits or whatever. Well, no benefits anymore. Two no, days passed with no sign of Nicole or her black Chevy Malibu. Oh. With no leads Malibu. in the case, Nicole's mother, Pat Arrakis, says in the episode, my uncle, Walt Werner, 
worked for the Hackensack, Hackensack Police Department. That's a hard thing to say. Hackensack. And he suggested a psychic that the police force sometimes used. That psychic was New Jersey resident Frank St. James, said to be known for finding missing persons. After seeing Nicole's picture, <laughs> St. James delivers the bad news on the third day of Nicole's disappearance. Nicole was no longer alive. She was dead. That would be what no one would like. <laughs> the Rockus family invited the psychic to their home to see if he could get more information. In their kitchen, St. James claims to connect with Nicole's spirit, who showed him her car in a marshy area close to home that could only be seen from the air. So they didn't search as much. I mean, not until the detective told him so. Yeah, yeah but it's, if it's close, aren't you searching it near? near it, it, yeah. You'd think. And it's a car. I mean, it's and, not like it's a... You know, if it's a marshy area, I don't know. Yeah, it might be the water or whatever. Well, eventually, good old Detective Novak was able to secure a helicopter to but, search local mon... You know, five days after her disappearance. It took him a while. It took him like two more days to get a helicopter. a helicopter. Where do they live? They don't have any helicopters? We're in Hackensack. And yeah, it's before <laughs> drones, too. Um, Novak <laughs> says he remembers thinking, please, God, let us find something. If we don't, I'm never going to be able to live this down because, you know, that helicopter was a big expense, I guess. Yeah. And it's only a... That's yeah, going to look bad. It's only a young, single mother. Well, you got a helicopter to look for her, even though you don't have to say it was, hey, I had the idea to get the helicopter. The helicopter pilot spotted a car that looked like Nicole's in a secluded, marshy area. Police did a ground search and found Nicole's body inside her Chevy Malibu. Reed was charged in her drug-induced death and sentenced to 10 years in prison. We had nothing, now retired Detective Novak says about the case. We found Nicole based on the information supplied to us by the psychic Frank St. James, and that's it. I don't see how anyone could dispute it. In her drug-induced death, so she mm -hmm. was on drugs. I, just, I think he gave he gave her. <laughs> he gave her some drugs. It was his fault. She didn't do it. It's a her. sad story. Yeah, it's, I mean these are true. I feel bad. Um, this psychic successfully pinpointed a small area on a 2,000-acre map as the location of a missing man's body. A few miles south of San Francisco lies the town of Pacifica, known for its rugged coastline intersected by California's famously scenic Highway One. The town is flanked by plenty of hiking trails and national park. Yeah, it's very nice. You've been there? It's a nice area. Uh, not for a long time. Yeah, I think Highway 1 fell into the ocean last week, too. Part of it, anyway. It might have been right there. When local residents and a former paratrooper, 71-year-old Dennis Prado, was reported missing in May of 1997, cops discovered Prado liked to go for walks and knew they had a tough job ahead of them. Finally, about nine to ten weeks into the disappearance, Detective Fernando Really Vatworth, Really Vasquez, Really Vasquez, of the police, Pacifica Police, told Nancy Grace, in 2005, his family had come to me and asked if I would go see a psychic on their behalf. Despite razzing from his colleagues, Detective Really Vasquez contacted psychic Annette Martin. Martin reportedly pinpointed a small area on a map that covered 2,000 acres a small area that Nancy Grace measured out to be the size of two city blocks. Searchers went to the location Martin chose and discovered Prado's body, just as she predicted. Based on the final conclusion, Really Vasquez told Grace she was very, very accurate. According to the Mercury News, Prado's appreciative family invited Really Vasquez to join them, spreading the man's ashes at sea under the Golden Gate Bridge. And so you don't think maybe he that's the. Are we? Th are we, we, think could, we could pinpoint that body because we put that body there. Yeah, well, she's lucky she didn't get. Her, I mean, I've heard of cases yeah. where they they arrest the, well, the they psychic. Yeah. Like, well, you did it. You did it because you. Yeah, did but it. you called me. Yeah, I don't know. We're... Um, a psychic led searchers to a five-year-old boy who was lost in the woods. I'm not saying these ones. On a stormy okay. night yeah. in 1975. Psychic Phil Jordan was contacted by the father of a boy who went missing after picnicking with his family at Empire Lake in Tioga County, New York. Earlier that day, five-year-old Tommy Kennedy, wearing nothing but a swimsuit, reportedly had a temper tantrum and ran into the national forest surrounding the lake. Bad boy. After an initial search by the family and park rangers failed to find the boy, the Tioga County Sheriff's Department were called to the scene as hundreds of volunteers searched in vain. By the time Detective David Redsicker and Phil Jordan arrived at the lake, 
The search was about to be halted until the next morning due to thunderstorms. Jordan brought a map with him that he reportedly, he reportedly drew at home to prevent the chaos at the scene from clouding his psychic impressions. Jordan's map is said to have led searchers through dense forest to an area that had yet to be searched. And in that area, cold and exhausted, was little Tommy Kennedy. Tommy. You should have come when you're called. Tommy. Now retired, David Redsicker said on Larry King Live. Not anymore. We had spent well over 12 hours with a couple hundred searchers without success. And it was actually less than an hour before Phil led us right to the boy. Why didn't they use dogs? Yeah, that probably would have been a little prudent. But and, it was, I don't know, it was And they'll work for biscuits. They'll work for biscuits. <laughs> a psychic led this man's family directly to the men who murdered him. Ah. Rosemary Kerr is a psychic featured in Psychic Detectives 2007 Midnight Strangers episode on the murder of Andre Daigle. Daigle went missing in 1987 after leaving a Louisiana bar with an unknown woman. Oh, those that'll get you every time. That's right. Police and Andre's family immediately began an exhaustive search of the New Orleans area. After three frustrating days, Daigle's sister reached out to California psychic Rosemary Kerr sending her a photo of Andre and a map of Louisiana. That's how it works. I said, a photo map? Fine. Fine. After touching the photograph, Kerr says she knew something terrible had happened and felt an urgency stronger than any other urgency she'd felt in a reading. After opening the map, Kerr was drawn to the New Orleans suburb of Slidell. Kerr called the Daigle family and told them to go to Slidell immediately. Do it now. Do it quick. Andre's family members reportedly raced towards Slidell, and when they got off the Slidell exit, they spotted Andre's truck on the road next to them. According to Andre James Gallagher of the Kenner Police Department, they pull up to the truck and they see two strangers. Andre's brother reportedly flagged down a cop car, and the truck was pulled over. The two suspects in the car were arrested for being in possession of a stolen vehicle, but there was no evidence of foul play. Well, so the car wasn't like on the side of the road. It was actually no, no. They were dri- They were driving along. Like, hey, there's this truck. Oh, jeez. Well, Captain James Gallagher told Psychic Kerr took, to the bar. Took uh, Psychic Kerr to the bar where Daigle was last seen. Andre Daigle was no longer alive. I think he was dead. Kerr said <laughs> he'd been murdered by two men. Kerr was. Is it not allowed? You're not allowed to say died. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. He'd been murdered by two men. Kerr was able to reportedly connect with Andre's spirit and was shown images of a body of water and railroad tracks, Captain Gallagher said. She described the location in great detail and stressed that the number seven was also very, very important. Detective Gallagher searched a previous apartment of the two suspects, apartment number seven. Oh, number seven. And found a huge blood stain, later confirmed to be Daigle's blood. The suspects, already in jail, thanks to Kerr, confessed to using a female accomplice to lure Daigle from the bar, then killing him in a convoluted plot to get into the mafia. I guess that's an... I don't know. That seems an odd way to get in. When the suspects led police to Daigle's body next to Interstate 7, 7, 7, Detective Gallagher confirmed that the location had everything she, Kerr, had described. I was stunned and amazed. Kerr later testified in the trial of one of the suspects. She was reportedly the first psychic to ever testify in a criminal trial because, as Detective Gallagher states, she led directly to the killer. You can't dispute that. That is a fact. That is fact. Both suspects were eventually convicted and reportedly serving life sentences. Wow. Okay, so now we come to what we were just talking about. This psychic was arrested after finding a murder oh, victim's yeah, body. Yeah, it's only it's inevitable that's going to happen. Anna Louise Smith lived in North Los Angeles and worked at Lockheed Aerospace Plant. It was 1980, and Smith was listening to a news update on the radio about nurse Melanie Reby missing for two days. Smith didn't consider herself a psychic, yet when she heard police were doing a house-to-house search, she felt certain... That search was headed in the wrong direction. Oh, no. She's not in the house, Smith thought. In her mind's eye, Smith reportedly, quote, saw where Uribe was, in Brush, less than two miles away in Lopez Canyon. In 2004, Smith described her psychic vision on Larry King Live. 
I could visually see where she was. I didn't know the name of the street, but I knew how to get there, and I couldn't shake this. After work, Smith went straight to the foothill station of the LAPD and showed Detective Lee Ryan on a wall map where she, quote, saw Uribe's body. On Larry King Live, Detective Ryan said that Smith, quote, had top security clearances. She lived in the community. She was obviously a professional businesswoman. Smith left the station with plans to meet up with Detective Ryan the next morning, but instead feeling an intense sense of urgency. She went, she went to Lopez Canyon, where she discovered the body of Melanie Uribe. After Smith alerted the cops of her discovery, she quickly became a suspect in Uribe's death. According to the LA Times, detectives questioned Smith for about 10 hours before arresting her on suspicion of having murdered the nurse. Smith was released four days later and never charged. Three men with no known connection to Smith eventually were convicted of the murder and are serving sentences of up to life in state prison. Oh, Smith ended up suing the LAPD for wrongful arrest and was awarded $26,000 in damages. Wow. Ohio cops busted one of their own for killing his wife, thanks to a psychic. Thanks to a psychic. In 2009, psychic investigators aired the episode Till Death Do Us Part about the 96 murder of Jennifer McGrady. Probably shouldn't laugh at these, but It's yeah. not funny, but that's yeah. a great name for a yeah. episode. Ohio State Trooper Jack McGrady reported his wife Jennifer missing to the Bell Parade Police Department, claiming she cleaned out everything she owns. Wedding rings were lying on the kitchen counter. Jennifer's mother immediately dismissed the idea that her daughter ran off with another man and abandoned her children. Georgia Rudolph was a local psychic, <laughs> local psychic, and said to have worked with the police for two decades. Rudolph told Bell Play Priest that she was connecting with Jennifer's spirit and that Jennifer was dead. Rudolph went on to tell Detective Dave Garvey that Jennifer was shot in the back of her head and that the man who murdered Jennifer was like a cop. Like a cop. Rudolph was also reportedly told, Rudolph also reportedly told Garvey that he could find Jennifer's body south of town near a road with the numbers 298. A day later, Detective Garvey checked out a local woman's report of seeing a state highway patrol car in the out of town area off highway 298 around the time of just Jennifer's disappearance. Garvey called a local detective to the scene, and together they found the fresh grave of Jennifer McCready. A jury later found Jack McCready guilty of the murder. In the episode, former Belfry police dispatcher Monty Tanner states, Georgia's information made a world of difference. It solved the case. Kevin Rings, assistant prosecuting attorney, also says, without that information and the resultant discovery of Jen's body, I don't think there would have even been a charge filed in the case against Mr. McCready. It would have been simply an unsolved missing persons case. Not only did she, Rudolph, say where the body would be discovered, she said that Jennifer was dead and before anyone else had reached that conclusion. And then she said, you might not want to hear this, but the person who killed her is a cop. Now retired Detective Sergeant Garvey said, added, Following George's guidelines or thoughts, whatever you want to say, led us to finding Jennifer. We found Jennifer. We found the bad guy. Wow. I mean, you thought having cameras were bad. <laughs> you know, now this. <laughs> they, they can hear your thoughts. Uh, you know. Um, this psychic helped police focus in on a quadruple murder suspect. In 1979, a central New York town was rocked by a quadruple murder inside a local nursery. In the, quote, blood money episode of Psychic Detectives, Sheriff Bill Hasenauer says the killings were probably the most hideous crime during my term of office. Shot execution style, the victims were the owner of the nursery who also ran a coin shop out of the building, his employee, and two bystanders. After an extensive, extensive investigation that led nowhere, Sheriff Hasenauer called psychic Phil Jordan, and we've talked to Phil before, yeah. to ask for help in the case. He found the little kid in the woods. Yep. Um, Jordan was reportedly able to describe the murders from the point of view of the perpetrators. 
He led detectives to a location outside of the nursery where stolen coins dropped by the killers were then discovered, an area the police had previously searched, finding nothing. Well, how did they not find the coins? Yeah, we're... Jordan also said that the getaway car was a small vehicle with a custom design. He reportedly stressed that the front end was funny and it looked like a Rolls Royce with that kind of front grille. His vision corroborated a report left on a police tip line that a Volkswagen was last seen near the crime scene. The Volkswagen with the Rolls Royce. I've seen those. When detectives tracked down a suspect in Florida, the suspect was driving a Volkswagen. Authorities canvassed local body shops and confirmed the suspect had altered the car so it no longer had a Uh customized Rolls Royce front end. Detectives now had probable cause to search the Volkswagen where they found some of the stolen coins. It's like having plastic surgery. Yeah. Had their car re-customized. Uncustomize it. That suspect and two other men stood trial for the murders. All were found guilty. Kurt Hamline, assistant DA of Oneida County, concluded that we were able to use a psychic who gave us certain information that helped us in the investigation. Phil's back again. Psychic Phil Jordan Good helped Phil. solve the killing of a teenage couple known as the Boca Raton High School sweethearts. Cynthia Rediger and John Fooch were, these names, were reported missing in January 1978. As detailed in an episode of Psychic Detectives, Palm Beach County Police contacted Psychic Phil Jordan for help with John Fuchs' car. After John Fuchs' car was found submerged in a canal, Jordan was brought to a picnic site that the cops believed the teen couple had visited on the day of their disappearance. In the scene, Jordan reportedly told investigators that they and were approached by two men. One had a shotgun and one had a rifle. I'm pretty sure they're dead. The cause of the death was gunshot wounds to the head. Yeah, yeah that will do it. To death. Among the psychic images, Jordan said he received said he received. One was a dilapidated white house with dark trim. We had already looked at an old white house, said Detective Rendell of the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. But now that Phil mentioned this, I wanted to go back again. So I went back. Now the house is empty. We find shell casings for a 22 rifle. The investigation stalled until two months later when a bicyclist reportedly found the bodies of Rediger and Fuchs in a rural area east of the picnic site. The cause of death for both teens was gunshot wounds to the head. A bullet fragment pulled from John's skull reportedly came from a 22 rifle. Detective Rindell contacted Phil Jordan again, asking him to try and get a description of the two suspects. Jordan gave Rendell a comprehend, composite drawing of what he envisioned the shooter looked like. He reported he also stressed that the initial A was tied to the suspects and that one or both of them were Latino or Mexican. Finally, Jordan said, told Rendell that a dog would be important to the case. Another crime rocked the area. A young woman was reportedly kidnapped and sexually battered, but she was able to escape. Palm Beach County's detective Sessa tells psychic detectives that the victim identified a man named Adam Herrera as the man who kidnapped and assaulted her. He subsequently, I subsequently placed him in handcuffs and arrested him, says Sessa. Then a tipster, tipster contacted police claiming that he'd sold his dog to a man who said, I know who killed the Boca Raton High School sweetheart. Why would you say that? <laughs> He's in the Palm Beach County Jail. He's just got arrested for sexual battery. Oh my God. Detective Rendell compared Herrera's photo with Phil Jordan's composite sketch. It was a strong match, said Rendell. Palm Beach County detectives also determined that Herrera had once lived in the same White House where Rendell found the shell casings. Herrera was an accomplice. Had Herrera and an accomplice were found guilty in the killings of Redinger and Fuch with Herrera eventually receiving two life sentences with no chance of parole. Every cop in this investigation did their best. Detective Rendell said about the convictions, Phil Jordan had had investigative ability too. He just had it in a different way. Wow. Um, A psychic searching an Australian nature reserve led police to the body of a murdered woman. These short ones, I, I, I'm always know I'm going to want more information. You're going to want more. In August of 2010, Aboriginal elder Cheryl Carroll 
later way claimed Whoa. to see <laughs> has a lot of name claimed to see the location of a missing child it's in Logger a dream. Way. Carol Loggerway went to that location. Nuragini. <laughs> Nuragini. Yeah, okay, you, you say it. Reserve. Nuragini. A suburb of Sydney, Australia, and reportedly succeeded in finding human remains. Police were called to the scene and later identified the body as Christy McDougall, uh -oh. a 31 year old woman reported missing in June. At the time, Chief Homicide Inspector Pam Young said that she had, quote, certain strong feelings about people who claim they are psychic. Are they good strong feelings or bad strong yeah, feelings? Yeah, there's strong there's no, feelings. No word on whether Young thanked Carol Lagerway for finding the body of Christy McDougall. The inspector was only quoted as saying that it was interesting that a woman had a sense or feeling that it was worth her while to come to this particular part of the park. Huh. A little terse there. Wow. The spirit of a murdered woman told this psychic who killed her, but it took 18 years for cops to prove it. Wow. Another cold case, huh? In 2006, psychic investigators aired an episode about the murder of Jackie Poole. Jackie's body was found in her West London apartment in February of 83. She'd been sexually assaulted and strangled with a cord. Yeah. The night before Jackie's body was found, local psychic Christine Holloman claimed that the spirit of the murdered woman appeared to her, identifying herself as Jackie Hunt. Jackie was recently divorced, and Hunt was her maiden name. I if she wanted to go by her maiden name. Constable Tony Batters was sent to interview Hollahan, and she shared details about her visions of the crime, which included a sweater that she felt was important to the case. The psychic reported amazed Constable Batters by giving reportedly amazed Constable Batters by giving him detailed information about Jackie's life. Holloman is said to have described the appearance of Jackie's killer, including his tattoo, also revealing the killer's name is Pokey. Pokey? Pokey Man. Pokey. Yeah, Pokey. There is a process known as automatic writing. It was like someone had taken my hand and very, very slowly written out the name. Holloman, Hollahan says of the experience, Pokey was discovered to be the nickname of a friend of Jackie's boyfriend, a man named Anthony Rourke. Rourke, already one of the suspects in the crime, his physical appearance was also said to match Hollahan's description. Police found a sweater which forensically linked Rourke with Jackie, but it was not enough to stop the 15-month investigation from being disbanded. Eighteen years later, Skin from under Jackie's fingernails was examined along with a bodily swab from the crime scene. The DNA was positively identified as Rourke's, whose DNA was no was on record because of the crime he had committed in 2000. Rourke was reportedly linked to Jackie's murder by a one in one billion chance. Retired Constable Tony Batters attended Rourke's trial. Rourke's trial. <laughs> According to psych investigators, the retired police officer had now had listed 130 specific points that Jackie claims she received from Jackie's spirit. That Christine claims she received from Jackie's spirit. Now he wanted to see how many were correct. An amazing 120 facts matched information brought out during the trial. And Batters, the constable's widow, confirms in the episode that her husband believed that the information must have come directly from Jackie. The jury found Rourke guilty and sentenced him to life in prison. Wow, 18 years, you know, he thought he got away with it. It looks like we got 23. 20. Well, I don't know if we're going to have 23. We're going to have some paranormal right. paranormal and unexplained encounters that, that freaked freak, people out. Freaked them out. No. All right. So, uh, okay. So um, I was about, this is from Postulate Bat. I was about 14 and had a friend spending the night. It was late. I want to say around 11 p.m. or so. We were joking around and we both noticed a circle of light on the wall above my bedroom door. Brighter than the little desk lamp that I had turned on. Now, neither of us was freaked out or anything, thinking anything weird was going on, mostly just curious. The window was opposite the door, so we thought that's where the light was coming from. We closed the blinds and when the light did not go away, we closed the curtains as well. The light was still there. 
we thought it may be coming from under the wind from the window and somehow or somehow and put our hands up and move them around to see if we could find where it was coming from maybe a hole or something a hole we found nothing we turned off the desk light thinking it was reflecting off of something nope still there it's now pitch black in the room except for this little circle of light on the wall above my door still not scared I climb up on the edge of my bed and put my hand in front of the light to see if I can trace where it is coming from. No light on my hand anywhere where I put it. I put my hand so close that it's almost touching the circle of light. No light on my hand at all. My friend says, what the heck? And I can tell we're both really confused. Just when I turn my back to where the light is behind my hand, it moves. No. Oh. Then it just goes away. My friend and I hope the heck my friend and I nope the heck out of my room. Oh, nope the heck out of my room and sleep in the living room. Still the most unexplainable thing that happened to me to this day. Would you like to hear about a woman's voice on a baby monitor? Ooh, the woman's it's, voice. It's 3 a.m. I'm sleeping in bed. I hear via baby monitor the baby beginning to stir and fuss. Then I hear via baby monitor a woman's voice humming and whispering. Shh, shh. I confirm the only other person in the house, my wife, is sleeping right next to me. I panic, run into the baby's room with violent intentions, and the baby is alone. The baby falls back asleep, but I do not. Wow. Visit from great-grandmother. So we're rolling in from ESP into parapsychology. Uh -huh. Um, okay, so this wasn't me, it was my mom. Recently, my great-grandmother died. She was extremely close with my mom. So anyway, my mom was on the couch and she was thinking about my great-grandmother when suddenly a small musical wind-up ornament started to slowly spin and play music. It was an ornament that my great-grandmother had given my mom when she was little. My siblings swear that they hadn't touched it. It's high up on the cabinet. Wow. They thought it was their boyfriend. I was home alone. I heard a key go in the front door. I assumed it was my boyfriend. I hear the door shut. Maybe you should be reading this. <laughs> <laughs> I hear him walk back in the bedroom, open the closet, empty his pockets, then turn off the light and close the closet. I get up to greet him. There's no one there. I've had that so many times in a dream. Really? Where I wake up, go back to sleep. I hear you come back home open the garage, come back into the bedroom. I hear you, I look at you, and then I wake up, you know, 10 minutes later, knowing damn that never, <laughs> that never it's happened. It's so <laughs> weird, just the weirdest <laughs> feeling. Um, weird things started after he passed. Weird stuff started happening after my brother passed away at our house. My bedroom light would constantly turn itself on. My touch, touch lamp would flick through all of its settings really fast. Songs on iPods would suddenly start changing to all songs instead of whatever playlist you were on. And the creepiest, most annoying one was you'd be in one room, walk out, walk back in, and all the paintings on the wall would be at an angle. Oh, I get the hell out of that house. Wow. Something communicated through the walkie-talkie. This happened to my friends and I when we were about 10. These are not my things. These are, these yeah, are just reading these things. We're okay. reading other people's stories. <laughs> we don't we want to clarify we're not this. this we're, we're, we're not this active. <laughs> um, I was at a friend's house, which is right up the street from my house, and another friend was there. For the story's sake, the friend whose house I was at will be friend one. The other friend will be two. We were playing with these walkie-talkies that friend one had just gotten. This night was in the middle of a week where friend one was talking about weird doings of his cats, meowing at nothing, running out of rooms for no reason. That's what cats do. Also, our moms were hanging out down the street at my house. It was about 9 p.m. We were joking about friends, how friends one's house was probably haunted. As a joke, friend one took the walkie-talkies, one in each hand, stuck his arms out to his side and said, if there are any ghosts in this house, give us a sign. Then after a few seconds of no sound but slight giggling from friend two and I, <laughs> friend one, Chucked one walkie-talkie across the room to scare us, but instead, we found it hilarious. <laughs> While we were laughing, friend one had set the walkie-talkie he didn't throw on a coffee table in front of him. As the laughter died down, 
the walkie-talkie on the table just made this weird howling sound that I have never heard before, never heard since, and haven't been able to accurately oh, describe God. since. The noise lasted about five seconds, and we were just frozen staring at the walkie-talkie. We then exchanged looks and ran out of the house screaming. <laughs> we went down to my house and told our moms, and basically just were scared the entire night. And your moms are telling me, just shut up. Yeah, it's like, yeah, sure, yeah. that happened. Rats. <sighs> The then there's the ghostly man in the apartment. This is posted by the Angry Taquito. Oh, the Angry Taquito. Ooh. Makes me want a taquito. When I was little, I used to live in an old apartment building in Mankato, Mini, uh, Mankato Minnesota. Minnesota. Mankato, Minnesota. It's Minnesota. While I was there, I had quite a few unexplainable events happen to my mom and me, my mom and I. <laughs> I lived with my dad, but he was a pilot, so he was gone a lot of the time. My dad used to leave early in the morning. He would be gone for a day or two doing pilot stuff. No pilot stuff. Yeah. I'm going to be going and doing some pilot stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my dad would come home late at night, and I would go up, go up to say hi to him and freak out with excitement like most kids would when their parents got home. Mm -hmm. My bed was arranged in my room so that I could see my parents' room across the hallway when I was laying in it. One night around midnight, I remember staring at my parents' bedroom across the hall when I saw a dark black figure enter the room. Nope. Nope. I, I figured it was my dad. So I, I don't even want to talk about it. So I jumped up and I didn't go to greet him. But when I entered the room, the only person in the room was my mom. And she was fast asleep in her bed alone. I also remember seeing a man from time to time in our apartment. He never really did anything. He would just kind of stand there or sit somewhere. I only saw him at most five seconds at a time in mirrors or at the end of hallways. At the time, I never really thought much of him because of how young I was. I think the only time he scared me was one day when my mom went down to the laundry room and I was left in the apartment alone. I was watching TV in her room when all of a sudden I heard a voice in the living room. I went out to see what it was and I saw the man sitting in a chair. I ran back to my mom's room and slammed the door shut and waited until my mom got home. There were a bunch of other weird things that would happen from time to time too, such as shadows and voices being seen and heard. Sure, your mom wasn't having an affair? I don't know, it sounds pretty weird, but <laughs> these are just the main events that I remember. Well, now we have a creepy visitor at three in the morning. Whoa, you know what they say. You know, three in the morning, somebody's watching you if you wake up. Oh, God, I always wake up at three. I've mean, been watched a lot, and it can't be that interesting. <laughs> I have had sleep paralysis occur to me before, which is freaky enough, but this wasn't sleep paralysis. Oh, that would freak me out, too. I was staying at the Hotel Utica for a job for a few weeks. On the first night there, this is from Molo, Molotovit. Um, on the first night there, after hearing that it was haunted, great, I wake up around 3 a.m. on my side feeling like someone is in the room. I turn my head slightly and look around the dark room and see nothing. I close my eyes and I get the feeling like someone is running towards my bed, getting closer and closer for about 10 seconds. It ends, and I, why did that door have to creak when it was creeping? It <laughs> ends and I feel like someone is about to jump onto the bed. It feels like everything coming to a climax, and I'm too afraid to turn my head completely <laughs> around. I gather the courage and turn my head, and everything stops. I'm staring at nothing but the wall less than four feet away from me. It turned out that almost everyone I was with also was awakened around that same time. Is that three o'clock? Three o'clock. Loud, unexplained noises are more annoying than scary. I know that's what you say. Oh, yeah. And this is from Like My Blue Eyes. I like my blue eyes. <laughs> I often heard someone coming up the stairs when there was no one there. This one was particularly annoying more than it was scary because the ghost thing or whatever the heck it was would do it all night long. Thankfully, it wasn't every night this happened. The scariest one for me was the time it sounded like every pot and pan in the kitchen was being banged together. Thrown around. This is a poltergeist. Yeah, I would be out of this house so and, fast. And slammed against the stove. It also sounded like every window downstairs was being banged on. It was loud. I remember seeing my oldest brother. I slept with my door open back then. Yeah, I would too. <laughs> Run across the hall into my younger brother's room because he was so scared and didn't want to be alone. 
I, however, just hid under the covers. Of course, upon inspection the next morning, absolutely nothing was out of place. And this is why I have big dogs. Because but then there, well, if there were anything happening in this house, yeah, our do dogs know yeah. exactly what's going on. And they make noise, and we don't get any sleep. Yeah. All right, now we have a dog trapped in the porcelain doll-filled room. I don't oh, know. Oh, wow. This is from Trey Thompson. Trey, what do you got, Trey. buddy? I'm currently watching my aunt's dog and house for the week while she's out of town. And last night I decided to go ahead and knock back a few beers, make myself some burgers. I turn Spotify on in the living room and then head for the kitchen and start cooking. Now I'm watching this little family of four dachshunds, which is super easy because they're all too small to get into any serious trouble. Ha! My only problem is they always bark at nothing in particular. Anyway, as I'm cooking, I hear a loud bang from the living room and a couple of the dogs start barking. The best way to describe the sound would be if you were to pick up one end of the couch then drop it onto a hardwood floor. Don't do that. I walk out and nothing seems to be out of place. I figured maybe the sound was from the song that was playing. Oh yeah, the song of Drop the Couch on the Hardwood Floor. <laughs> so I restart the song and listen for it. Nothing. Well, after not seeing anything wrong, I brush it off, go back to cooking my food. About an hour or so later, sitting on the couch watching TV, and I hear scratching. Oh no. I mute the TV well, it's and the listen. Dog. <laughs> my dogs are always scratching on oh, my ears. I still hear the scratching, so I get up, open a bedroom door, and one of the dachshunds hightails it out of the room. This door has not been opened once since I arrived. How did that dog get in there? Oh, I have yeah. no clue how the dog managed to get in or why the door slammed shut behind it. I haven't gone in this room because I know my aunt has a massive collection of creepy porcelain <laughs> dolls in it, and I don't have much reason to look at a scary doll room. There have been two separate deaths in the house since my aunt moved in almost 30 years ago. I spent a good few hours outside after that. Oh, yeah, me and the dog yeah. were camping in the backyard. You'd be moving out. You'd be packing. There was a ghostly man upstairs from a deleted user. Thank you, deleted <laughs> user, for this story. During my senior year of high school, my parents finally separated. <laughs> and my mom, I guess that's been coming for a long time. Huh? That sounds like you. No wonder it's a deleted user. And my mom and I ended up moving into a vacant side of the duplex my boyfriend lived in. Oh, I'll say this, so this isn't Brandon writing. He had told me plenty of stories before about how the place was haunted. But I was skeptical and never really believed him. My mom had taken up a second job to make ends meet, and for the second job, she wouldn't get home until around 10 p.m. on Thursday nights. One Thursday night around 9, I was winding down for the night. I turned off the television and the lights downstairs and started heading upstairs to read for a little while, since I still wasn't really tired enough to go to bed. I was walking up the stairs behind my dog, and the way the house is set up, the stairs go up to a landing where they make a U-turn, then you go up some more stairs to the second floor. At the top of the stairs, there's a window that had just enough light coming through the blinds to be able to see. I'm going up these stairs behind my dog, and when we get to the second set of stairs that go to the second floor, my dog stops and gives her tail a little wag like there's someone there. What happens next goes by in a matter of seconds. I look up to see what she's looking at. In the light of the window, I see a figure of a person. I say out loud thinking that that's my mom. Oh, I didn't know you were home already. I suddenly realize it can't be my mom because she would have to have walked past me to get upstairs. And this is occurring to me. As this is occurring to me, the dark figures appears to rush behind me toward. as it gets closer toward me as it gets closer. It takes on a more masculine form and then it's gone. I freaking bolt up the rest of the stairs, lock myself and the dog in my room with all the lights on until my mom got home. Shortly after that, the boyfriend, his oldest brother, and I start doing a little ghost hunting, and I got some creepy EVPs. Once I, one I will never forget was a small old rural graveyard where we heard a voice clearly say, Kill me, let me die. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Well, that's another episode of the Alien Probe podcast of the paranormal and ESP. Deb, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Doug. That was fun. So you'll look into a couple of those. Sure. Let's, let's get a little more background on that stuff. 
see us on Facebook and Instagram, and we can catch us on Spotify and Apple, Apple Podcasts. And um, thank you very much for listening, and we really appreciate it. And uh, email us at thealienprobepodcast at gmail.com. And uh, we appreciate the stories. Keep them coming. Thank you.